Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dina Matar, at the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this uh, final session on the conference on the right of return uh, for Palestine and Pal Palestinians. Um, so the panel is called um, Right of Return, Activism, Agency and Return, and we've got four speakers. It's going to be an exciting session where we come to think about the agency and the activism uh, around this very important uh, topic. We've heard in the previous sessions hist histories of the right of return. We've also had uh, international law perspective and other perspectives, and it's been a very stimulating day. Um, may I please ask the um, the um, the audience to put their questions? There's a question and answer uh, uh, kind of icon at the uh, end of your screen. Put your questions there, and I will pose them to um, to the speakers. So uh, first to speak is uh, Dr. Mesna Kato from the University of Cambridge, and her title is Chalkboard Pal Palestine. Uh, uh, Chalkwood Palestine, Schooling, Education, and Return. It seems a very interesting topic. Um, while Mesna is speaking, I'm going to go, um, you know, kind of dark and silent. So please um, welcome Mesna, and the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Abed, Nimir, and everyone, and Reem, and everyone at Birzeit, Houston, and SOAS for organizing this really um, exciting um, seminar series or, or conference. Um, in, in my time with you today, in my short time with you, I'd like to reflect on a particular phrase or clause often used by Palestinians and their allies in the documentation of their rights, in their advocacy, in their mobilization. And, it, and the phrase is, you know, XXX, the right to return as enshrined by Resolution 194. As we've seen throughout the day, 194 as resolution is legitimated through the institutions which produced it, but its power comes from its tactical use in, in demands and claims made by Palestinians and their allies. But here I'd like to offer a proposition. How can we see 194 as perhaps in, in produced by international instruments, but whose power and political legitimacy is not so much enshrined, but is exercised? This is not necessarily a matter of resistance or its celebration per se. And there's tons of literature on this, right? Um, this is not a rehearsal of, for example, how Palestinians respond to challenge or push international law, take it up or take it down, or, but it's to think beyond, in fact, the dyad of resistance and repression. And I want to do so today through one of the most important crucibles for articulations of belonging and togetherness for nearly everyone, not just Palestinians, but certainly including them, schooling. And I'll do so through three forms of what I would regard as schooling as return. One, return as act and infraction. Two, return as experimentation and curriculum. And three, return through collective study. Now, in terms of return as act and infraction, one of the things that is often left out in terms of the idea of return, um, there's so much emphasis on the ways in which Palestinians and Palestinian young people um, are taught to demand return. Um, you know, there's a famous kind of, or there's an often used discourse in particular refugee studies, but in other places, that every Palestinian child knows how to rehearse Resolution 194, that Resolution 194 is taught in classrooms and that sort of thing. And I'll get to that in a minute. But here, what I want to lay claim to is that the very first act of a Palestinian child was to in fact attempt to return home. That in, in the aftermath of the Nakba, hundreds upon hundreds of Palestinian young people would escape the, the, the tent classrooms that were made for them, that were set up for them by UNRWA and other institutions 
and in fact would run to the border in an attempt to go home. This is, in a sense, the Palestinian, in the moment in which they were gaslit into thinking that they no longer existed, asserting through their, through, through their hike, through their walk, through their trespass of the seam zone, the border, the minefield, that they themselves refuse that act of um, erasure and that they knew and understood where they come from and they, where, did they, where they wanted to go. This act of return as act and infraction continues throughout the next 70 years as, Pal as Palestinian young people and students and their teachers entered into political formations, developed their own political formations, marched, rallied, um, organized, mobilized, developed secret clubs and societies, and in fact, in 1968, marched towards another place, Kerame, in order to build and reimagine a new way for them to return. This was an infraction because of the instruments that were utilized to um, um, uh, criminalize these initial acts of physical return, be they international, be, be it the new Israeli state, international regimes, and in fact, their host or their quote unquote host countries and, their, the, and the regimes of those and inter, um, military apparatuses of those host countries. In this sense too, Palestinians, when they made, when they enacted and attempted to enact this kind of return, um, they entered into an alliance amongst themselves of, of that required um, a shared sense of precarity and physical self-endangerment. Um, I wanted now, so, and, and I will, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but here I want to actually emphasize, uh, you know, the, the ways in which they try to mitigate this danger through the formation and they're entering into what they themselves built up and created within the PLO of PLO schools, of PLO, um, uh, you know, young training camps and building and, and working together to strengthen themselves bodily in terms of their body, their physical capacities in order to think about, they, own, they built themselves bodily in order to return. Second, return is experimentation and a curriculum. One of the most important things we need to think about in terms of return and this idea that young people, every Palestinian young child can rehearse 194. What is that such schooling emerges despite, not because of um, the institutions that were built um, and that claim to support them. Um, since the Nakba, return became an important and central project for a pedagogical project for teachers, students, and parents alike. When school, indeed schooling itself, and the idea that a Palestinian must become an educated um, citizen was to become an educated citizen of a tomorrow Palestine, a Palestine that must be created and built through the pedagogical power of its future citizens. But beyond that, it was to experiment and to develop schooling and imaginative curriculums that would in fact create and build what Palestine will become. In 1948, this meant that in the middle and in the midst of war, Palestinians would gather themselves in order to educate their young people. In the 1950s and 1960s, it meant the building up of the architecture of the UNRWA educational system and in the um, sort of the political pressure by Palestinians, Palestinian parents and students and teachers alike in how that system will be developed. But it also meant in any schooling that they had within public schools and elsewhere, a kind of setting, a, setting um, space for determining 
other imaginative possibilities for schooling. For example, experimentations in pedagogical practices, uh, debates and discussions around the idea of building Dewey style systems, Montessori uh, entering into discussions and building and exercising and experimenting with Montessori schools. In their first intifada, it was enter, you know, it was developing schools outside of classrooms such that they might be able to um, continue on with the project of education despite curfew and the collapse of uh, formal ar architectures as a result of Israeli violence. Um, this kind of experimentation is crucial um, in understanding how Palestinians develop, is crucial not just because by virtue of the fact to celebrate you know, this education as being experimental or radical or progressive. And I think, although I think that is crucial, it's because, because it answers a particular question of why they developed these schools to begin with. One, it was for a future Palestine. It was to think about the tomorrow of Palestine, but it was a concern, a deep founded concern that this return must be radical and progressive and that it can only be so through this through a continual experimentation and an continual insistence on 194 at, or return per se as a sort of central crucible through which experimentation can be made. Third, um, in terms of return through collective study. Um, one of the things that I think is often, um, you know, um, articulated when we think about 194 is return as something that will happen. What I want to propose through here is to think about return through collective study. And by which I mean the, the, the historic multiple ways and multiple forms through which Palestinians in gathered as a beginning, as a way of expressing the possibilities and the, um, um, the, 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 um, the um, makings through which return is made possible. And here I think of Palestinian experimentations um, of collective study through uh, in gatherings at universities wherever they might find themselves, be it Baghdad, Yemen, Lebanon, Detroit, Chicago, New York, Santiago, uh, Delhi. Anywhere Palestinians found themselves as young people, they tried to find others. And in so doing, they built together all sorts of historic institutions, Al Auda, uh, the Arab American University graduates, and far, far earlier, the Palestine Anti Zionist Society in New York. Um, and, and in fact, um, any kind of Palestinian student mobilization, the most important, of course, of which is the General Union of Palestinian Students. These formations may be regarded and often dismissed or in fact fetishized as some sort of popular arm of the PLO, but I think their most important and their most um, radical articulation is as sites of collective study and in so being sites of Palestinian ingathering um, and, so, and, and, uh, and um, exercising um, relations and socialities of care in their, in their exile and in their shatat. So what am I trying to say with these three acts of return? Really what I'm saying is that Palestinians are already returning. That acts of return, that 194 isn't so much enshrined and therefore something that must be achieved, but that its achievement is it's an, it's, it is an exercise, it's a muscle. And insofar as Palestinians build and work through acts of physical return, through acts of experimentation and political and popular mobilization, through acts of curricular, um, uh, curricular um, and pedagogical practice, and through collective study, they are already returning. They move towards return. This is all part of return. That 194, in fact, in, 
becomes a, a sort of language that Palestinians work through, but always work in excess of. And therefore, what I want to end by saying is when I mean chalkboard Palestine, I think very much of a very kind of oft repeated line, but a very powerful one in Kenafani's return to Haifa. When, he, when Sophia is asked, what is the nation, Sophia? And, and she responds, homeland. What is homeland? Ma huwa al-watan ya Sophia? Al-watan huwa al-mustaqbal. So what we, what I hope to believe, what I hope 194 um, can be rethought of to say is that um, the right to return is one to a future that we're already, and Palestinians are already making, that they're etching and re-etching um, every day, everywhere. And that this return and 194 will not be enshrined, but will be exercised by Palestinians themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Masna. That was a powerful uh, beginning for this uh, panel, particularly your idea of a collective study, which might seek in really well to what my student's career from King's College is going to talk about, the right of return, the pitfalls of contra contrarian research. So welcome, my student. I'm going to mute myself and uh, leave you the space. Maysoon, you are on mute. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, thanks for the invite. I start. I want to return Palestine to our land, wrote a 10 year old Palestinian from Shatila Cab on her drawing for an NGO workshop in Lebanon. Betty Araja Palestina Arutna. The drawing was a hit. When the girl was asked where her land was, she said it was in the camp. The relation then of the Palestinian to the camp became a story that seemingly undermined the Palestinian refugees' return to Palestine. The drawing was put in an exhibition and took a life on its own, eventually printed on a t-shirt, one of which you can see displayed behind me here. Uh, a drawing of a 10-year-old became kitsch it came to represent the attachment of the Palestinians to Shatila and how they wanted to stay. It started to be invoked whenever the issue of refugee return heated up, as if to say Palestinians belong to their camps, they feel home in their camps. This, of course, drew attention to the NGO, and the NGO itself put it in many of its own proposals as a way to project that we are doing something different. We allow children to say that they want what they want and express themselves freely without any restrictions. Unlike other NGOs who try to indoctrinate children to their politics, as one of the NGO worker, workers said, this, we are different and we don't do like others do, is a trope I want to investigate today when it comes to researching the right of return in Lebanon, ROR from now on. Uh, the talk will investigate how structural incentives and pressures of the higher education grant and publishing economy to be uh, economy to be contrarian, by which I mean the need to constantly come up with new ideas and arguments for the sake of being entrepreneurial, how this impacts how the, reader, the ROR is studied and understood in Lebanon. I will name them the contrarian entrepreneur researchers and relate this to the political economy of research and how it has affected studying the struggle for return. Ironically, the over research Palestinians in Lebanon is connected to the ROR. Shatira became known as a site for studying refugees to a due to a combination of different factors in the 90s. The start of the peace process classified refugees as a final status topic, and as a result, deferring any agreement to their status indefinitely. The period also witnessed an economic crisis, a lack of jobs, and the launching of student loans, which contributed to a surge of PhD-level student enrollment in the US and elsewhere. 
Uh, many of these students were inspired by the Auda or right of return movement in the 1990s, who then came to study the refugees. The 90s also witnessed a raging debate in Lebanon over the civil rights of Palestinian. Lebanese authorities consistently argued that any granting, a granting of civil rights to Palestinian refugees would undermine the right of return as part of its contribution to pressure Palestinian negotiators to put the right of return on the table. The hype of the uh, right of return mellowed down after the 9-11 attacks, and the researcher who came after that started to, started to reread the ROR and issues surrounding Palestinians in Lebanon. It was also a time when the post-colonial critique of nationalism and national struggles was at its peak. Furthermore, given the over-research of the preceding period, researchers needed to find new ways distinguishing their work, new gaps in the literature to fill in, and new scholarly frameworks to test out in their fieldwork. Instead of a displaced population facing discrimination in its host country while, while struggling to return, the Palestinians of the early 2000s needed to be liberated from their Palestinian identity and re as humans who want to live and belong where they are. As one scholar put it, refugees can't hold the brunt of the uh, right of return or the Palestinian struggles. While, of course, it's very important not to reduce or restrict Palestinian to their Palestinianness, there are both political and ethical issues that need to be asked about the way we are writing them off their Palestinianness. However, much of this is couched in the language of researcher humanitarianism that only seek to restore the Palestinian, their humanity as individuals. Beside the NGOs we were trying, uh, who were trying to tailor their discourse to funders, academics' infatuation with what is new and different led some to take the discourse of the right of return out of context, context and give it one interpretation, doubting the intention of the Palestinians to return to their homes. This will be illustrated through three examples. The first process, uh, process I want to talk about is the pitfalls of reading right of return of the, of the civil rights in Lebanon. In Lebanon, right of return has been emptied as a slogan by its first champion, the PLO, who completely turned its back on the Palestinians. Second, by the other champion of the right of return, the Lebanese state, which is responsible for the systematic legal discrimination and treatment of Palestinians as potential security threats and the cause of the civil war. Indeed, the more anti-Palestinian Lebanese politicians, the more uh, likely they are to publicly support right of return to, cut, uh, to get Palestinian out of Lebanon. Uh, Hazim Zamzoum sums up the dilemma of the right of return in Lebanon brilliantly when he says, as a public political demand, the right of return takes on a dual character. On one hand, uh, it is la the lifelong dream and redress of a collective trauma of displacement and exile. On the other, demanding it publicly aligns you with a fascist who want you come and fight tooth and nail to deprive you from your civil rights." And of course, um, despite all this complication of the ROR, there are several academics who still take declaration of Palestinians on this right when the Palestinian prioritize their civil rights as a way to argue that we should not restrict the study of Palestinian to national struggle and national identity. These include quotes taken from marches on civil rights in which Palestinians declare in some forms that they do not want the right of return. When put in this context, Palestinians who speak up as if against the right of return in marches for their civil rights might be declaring an outcry against the Lebanese government connection of the right of return with the civil rights. It might, it might be a way to highlight just how important civil rights are to them than to outright discourse, let alone, uh, uh, sorry, let, uh, um, are to them than to outright denounce, let alone, alone renounce the right of return. To take such statements out of context, to liberate Palestinian studies and the Palestinian from the struggle and the oppression 
of reducing them to freedom fighters and to argue for the need to focus on the quotidian is perhaps another way of, of oppressing them, deciding for them how they should be studied and represented as individuals living in the camps. Some researchers speak of that as ethical, but ethics here is read off of politics. Okay, that was the first process. The second process I want to highlight is the writing on private versus public and how that Palestinian, what Palestinians says in public about the ROR is different from the, what they say in private. This was attributed to a discourse that Palestinians have to perform their Palestinianness in public from fear either of being rejected by their communities or from political parties in the camps or being seen as traitors. Therefore, the argument goes, we should always read with a grain of salt what we hear from the Palestinian in public because it is a performance, a performance of their identity as Palestinians belonging to the collective and being denied their individuality in a context in which they are oppressed by their national identity. One of the stories told to show this dichotomy is of a old man, an old man who always preaches about the return in public to journalists and researchers, expresses his longing to Palestine and his village, and continuously expresses his willingness to do anything to see his village again. Uh, however, through earning an EU passport, one of this old man family members was able to visit the village from which the family was displaced by Zionist forces in 48. When the family member came back and wanted to show the father the picture, that member found that, that the old man in his 80s did not even want to look at the photographs from this village, adamantly refusing to check them out. The researchers purpose in telling the story repeatedly was to emphasize the need to check the performativity of the older Palestinians because they have gotten used to performing the right of return demanding Palestinianness. There are many questions to be asked here about the sole interpretation given to the father's behavior and the analysis based on private public and the ways Palestinians are taught to, public, to, to publicly perform their national identity while in private, they are not. First, the idea of the father unwillingness to look at the picture could be attributed to the fact that it might be too emotional to him to see it. Or maybe he doesn't want to see pictures. He wants to keep the pictures as he had in his mind when he left. Is it inconceivable that a man in his 80s wanted to avoid triggering his own trauma of forced displacement by looking at photos of the site of that trauma? Perhaps he is scared to look at the picture, which could be interpreted as endorsing the family member's visit to Israel, something many Arabs, not only Palestinian, find to be an act of normalizing Palestinian dispossession. Or perhaps re um, returning to a village still under occupation with the permission of the military forces that occupies it, only to snap some photos and, and leave again, is not the return that the father wants even in his public performances. Given all of these very relatable and understandable possibilities for refusing to see the photos, why was, was this act of refusal transformed into a full-blown argument about a bifurcation of the Palestinian psyche into a public performativity of demanding return that stand in stark contradiction to an interior and private rejection of that reform, return? Further, the public-private dichotomy as central to this kind of argument deserves further scrutiny. What was private about the moment in which the old man refused to look at the photos of his destroyed and depopulated village? We are not told who else was in the room. Though the return of the family member after absence would presumably be a family affair. We're not told anything about the dynamics of the family members. So, what was private here? Is it the absence of journalists and researchers that makes an event private? Is it only Western eyes that can make something public? A third set of writings, the last one, is connected to the research of Palestinian identity and sense of home. Belonging and sense of home has become prominent in research on migration. Where is home? What, what does home mean? Blah, 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 blah. 
I would like to approach the stream of literature and its pitfalls through a story that happened to me. It was in 2000 when we went to the borders after the liberation of the South. I was with a group of teenagers from Shatila that I, was, I worked with for a while. They had developed a strong group identity, strong bonds of attachment as we used to meet on a daily basis. The students were so excited to go see Palestine from the borders. It was a very emotional day when we reached the border. They were Palestinian, there were Palestinians from their villages uh, on the other side of the barbed wire fence across which those who had flocked to the border asked one another all sorts of questions and started stories and laughter and tears. On the way back, one of them suddenly asked, what will happen if we all return to Palestine? Each of us will go to their village. The dissonance of that sort drove her to look on the map to see what, uh, which of the others would be close to her. She was from Daishun. There was a silence. Then one of them screamed from the back of the bus, don't worry, we will build a village in Palestine and call it Shatila, and that way we can stay together. For a researcher of, of the kind I'm examining here, the lesson from such a moment would undoubtedly be to claim that when facing return as possible reality, these Palestinian teenagers might not want to return because they see their home as Shatila. For us in the bus, who were aware of the nitty gritty details of the relationships in that group, it was much more obvious that this was a group of teenagers who had been together all their lives, attended the same school, and shared a bond of friendship central to each of their individual senses of home and belonging. But friendship was not a topic that is studied amongst the refugees, and this is not a call to study itself. The story was told and retold again about where they felt home. And anyway, feeling home is more of a cosmopolitan class existential dilemma than a worry for the refugees. But regardless, I'm not sure who on earth can deny people to belong where they live and the only place they know. What a discovery that the Palestinians in Shatila loved and belonged to their camps, despite the fact that they curse it and live a constant state of uprising against their dire conditions. To be surprised that people who lived in a place for so long and actually belong to it is the problem. As if now we discovered that Palestinians belong where they are. Perhaps if it was not mentioned before, it's because it was taken for granted. Moreover, the right of return does not mean that everyone has to return to Palestine. As a legal right and a political entitlement, it is a right to choose whether they want to stay in Shatila or return. Feeling bonds of friendship and belonging to the camp by itself does not in, a way, in any way undermine those rights. Why was that treated as a startling discovery to start with? Funnily, the ROR for most of the Palestinians in Lebanon was a given. Barely any knew of the UN Resolution 194, but thought it was their natural right. If someone kicks you out of your house, you are entitled to go your, to your house back. Simple as that. They didn't feel they need a UN resolution or an international court of justice decision. It was a historical fact. They were driven out and they will return one day. It is just common sense. I want to conclude by coming back to the point with which I began. A concern with the pressures and incentives in the university and in NGOs to be contrarian, to always need to say something new and different. I think if we reflect on this issue, we can all find many examples of these pressures and incentives in our working environments. The argument that I want to make here is not that being contrarian is always harmful or problematic, but that it can become harmful or problematic when it is being done for the sake of being contrarian or for the sake of being uh, getting new grant, new publication, new niche in the field. Indeed, there is an alternative type of contrarianism that I would argue is vital to embrace in research and work on Palestine. This is a contrarianism that we might call, following the work of Laura Nader, a critical form of contrarianism as distinct from the entrepreneurial contrarian scholarship that I have been speaking about thus far. In her latest work, Laura Nader, and as a critique of the intertwinement of the academy to the establishment, argues that a contrarian anthropologist is a critical one that seeks to unravel 
how professional mindset are constructed and made hegemonic as a step towards committing to justice, not harmony. So no peace studies. Uh, to the powerless through strategic power and to colleagues in academia to unravel how they are themselves part of the system they sometimes criticize. As a grip of external funding in academia, the financialization of the research and the crackdown on Palestinian activism tighten the need for a critical contrarian scholarship of Palestinian studies and critical contrarian scholars whose widespread respect comes from integrity, honesty, and aversion to power becomes ever more obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Maisun. That was again a very powerful kind of speaks to my own concerns uh, uh, presentation. And it reminded me a lot of what Edward Said spoke about in his brilliant book, After the Last Sky, you know, researching or writing about Palestine as being, you know, subjects and objects of study about, about Palestinians. Um, but again, uh, thanks again, and looking forward to asking some questions of you. Um, I now, um, I now uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rafif Ziade from SOAS, and, and she's going to talk about organizing the right of return. So hopefully we're thinking uh, around the question of agency, but uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dina, uh, and thanks to the organizers and the hosting centers who put this event together. Um, I followed all the sessions and it has been really remarkable. I really hope we can have more collaborations like this uh, in the future. Um, speaking on a panel with Maisun uh, and Mizna and Akram, my first instinct is to cede my time so I could listen to them, but I don't think I'm allowed to do that. So I wanted to speak to you today um, around organizing for the right of return, which wasn't the title I came up with, um, but when I saw it, it was, I thought this was the most fitting um, way to have this conversation as the right of return, something that we are, we are doing and we are organizing for, something that is lived and continuous. This conference has invited us to a conversation about the Palestinian right of return on the 72nd anniversary of UN Resolution 194, which of course stipulated the right of return of Palestinian refugees to their original homes, as well as reparations, among other stipulations. Obviously, for 72 years, the resolution has not been fulfilled, along with countless others concerning Palestinian rights. Palestinian refugees are denied the right of return and remain the world's largest refugee population. Of course, here it's worth noting that in our region of the world, now most of the countries are holding, competing for that title of the world's largest refugee population, and it's very important to keep that in mind. But very importantly for our conversation today, Palestinian refugees remain the majority of Palestinians. Um, as Nimr said earlier in the day, two thirds of the Palestinian population are refugees. So any conversations about Palestine, decolonization, or even solidarity without speaking about Palestinian refugees is essentially ignoring the majority of Palestinians. This is precisely why the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 47, 48, that led to the flight of more than three quarters of the Palestinian population is not simply a painful historical memory. What Palestinians call a Nakba, the catastrophe, remains very much part of lived reality and it structures Israel's ongoing settler colonial project. It is felt in the longing of millions of Palestinians to return to their homes and lands from which they were expelled decades ago. It is seen in the segregation of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip to scattered population centers divided from one another by Israeli settlements, military checkpoints, and Israeli-only highways. These open-air prisons surrounded by an apartheid wall and its associated infrastructure of settlements, military zones, and roads mean that Palestinians are now confined to approximately 12% of historic Palestine, and even that 12% is dwindling. And of course, the Nakba remains, with those Palestinians who stayed on their land and became Israeli citizens forced to live as second-class people in a state built on the destruction of their national identity. Palestinian refugees in particular are presented as a stumbling block or a problem in mainstream frameworks of conflict resolution, which were the dominant perspective on Palestine, particularly those that were hegemonic through the 1990s. 
These presented the issue as an intractable conflict between two equal sides, with the promised solution coming from the paternalistic intervention of the West, um, the so-called honest broker paradigm. This framework, upon which the accords between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization is based, gives little regard to the bloody hand of colonialism, specifically British colonialism, in the creation of the so-called Palestine problem in the first place. This conflict resolution model also helped to frame the right of return itself as something negotiable among a long list of concessions to be made, rather than the right of return being the core of Palestinian liberation and anti-colonial struggle. In such frameworks, the historical reality of Palestinian dispossession and the fact that Palestinians in the Middle East are now fragmented across at least four geographical spaces, the Arab world, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and inside Israel is simply lost. It is in this context and in relation to these frameworks that I want to discuss the right of return today. And I want to argue that we are here at the logical end, but also a very dangerous juncture of such frameworks, whereby economic pacification policies are openly being pursued in an attempt to liquidate the Palestinian right of return. In conjunction with these policies of economic pacification and geographic fragmentation, there is a concerted silencing campaign attempting to criminalize even discussion of the Nakba and the right of return. In that sense, I'm really thankful to the organizers of this conference for clearly encouraging scholarly and activist ex exchange as it pertains to the right of return. Such silencing campaigns, was, one must say, are not new by any measure of the imagination, and I think Edward Said's permission to narrate spoke eloquently about this type of racialized denial of history. But let me start on the context of organizing and what I mean by economic pacification. In many ways, the reality faced by Palestinians today, the denial of the right of return, the ongoing military occupation and colonization of Palestinian land is a result of the policies of consecutive Israeli governments, whether to the so-called left or right of the Israeli political spectrum. Israel has been contending since, since its inception with this central quandary of an exclusionary nationalism attempting to manage an occupied population. But it must also be said that this trajectory of Israel's settler colonial project has been combined with a disastrous strategic orientation of the Palestinian national movement through the 1990s. It is a course that was solidified in 1993, Oslo Agreements, and the famous handshake between Palestinian President Yasser Arafat and Israeli Prime Minister Ishaq Rabin on the White House lawn in the warm embrace of Bill Clinton. The Oslo process reduced the demand for Palestinian liberation and return to a state building project on ever shrinking slivers of land managed by a very narrow coterie of Palestinian officials in the West Bank and Gaza. The right of return, among other central questions to Palestinians were put on the back burner. More importantly, refugees became bargaining chips rather than as agents in their own liberation. The economic pacification policies pursued today aim at putting pressure on the Palestinian population to accept a monetary package uh, in return for truncated autonomy and very importantly for dismissing the right of return. It is very much within the Trumpian business deal model that an entire population will give up on their rights if there is, if there is a monetary package that they can receive. But it is within the tenets of the Oslo Accords and the Paris Protocol in particular that this type of economic dependency um, and economic colonization was forged. The Paris Protocol binds the Palestinian economy with Israel via a customs union that leaves no space for independent Palestinian economic policies. It connected the OPT trade policies, tariff structure, and value added tax rate to Israel. Moreover, authorities in Israel collect trade tax revenues on behalf of the Palestinian Authority. They are meant to transfer these, but of course these have been held back as a form of pressure on the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian fiscal resources are going to the treasury of Israel estimated at hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And here I am emphasizing this economic 
side of it, because quite often there is a lot of writing on the infrastructures of the occupation, the militarism, um, the checkpoints, the apartheid wall, but these economic dynamics of colonization are often not discussed and not put forward. Decades of de-development policies have destroyed the productive base of the Palestinian occupied ter territories. Military attacks destroy the infrastructure, Military policies enshrine both geographical and economic fragmentation. Various restrictions on imported inputs and technology make it difficult for industries and services to function. Of course, this is along with the very direct land theft, settlement expansion, and of course the siege on the Gaza Strip that has caused the economy there to collapse. Almost all Palestinian imports and exports transit via ports and crossings of Israel at which delays and security measures can increase costs. Many of you would know about the barriers of movement um, and this type of economic strangulation. There is a long list of dual use uh, technologies that are not allowed and are banned to the Palestinian economy. This list contains 56 items requ requiring special approval. In the current COVID-19 moment, it has really become clear uh, the issues with this use of forbidding importation of dual use projects because many of them are used in hospitals and you could really see the impact on Palestinian hospitals. As a very clear example of this economic colonization, in March, tw March 2019, the government of Israel began to implement its law mandating the deduction of 12 million per dollars per month from Palestinian clearance revenue equivalent to the payments made by the Palestinian Authority to families of Palestinian prisoners and martyrs. At first, the Palestinian Authority rejected this cut, but eventually they have accepted it. And here it's very important to recognize that these cuts do not simply impact Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories. And this is part of the issue that has happened with the collapse of the Palestinian Liberation Organization into the budgets of the Palestinian Authority. Those cuts to the families of, of martyrs affect refugees in Lebanon, refugees in Jordan, um, who, who do get these payments because we have to remember that these populations had undergone um, their own wars in various points of Palestinian history. So when we speak of this kind of strangulation, it is also a strangulation of Palestinian refugees. It really works against the methodological nationalism of thinking there is such a thing as an independent Palestinian economy. What exists is a captive economy in the occupied territories, but one that also has um, a connection to Palestinians living everywhere. Of course, I have to say that the impact of these economic pacification policies is not even. Um, there have been some that profited very handsomely from the neoliberalization of the, uh, of the occupied territories. Um, and here I would urge people to engage with the excellent works by Palestinian political economists like Tariq Dana, Ala Tartir, Samia Butmet, Tawfiq Haddad, Adam Haniya on this particular subject, because it's also important to recognize that Palestinians do have class differentiation among them and that policies of neoliberalization also have internal beneficiaries. But in addition to Israel's policies, of economic strangulation, the donor community has been complicit in this economic pacification. Donor aid cuts have worked to tighten the noose on the Palestinian population. Donor aid has actually fallen from 32% of GDP in 2008 to 3.5% of GDP in 2019. Most notably for this conversation today is of course the connection being made between cuts to the budget of UNRWA and the right of return. These cuts impact very basic services that UNRWA is able to provide. The Trump administration through Jared Kushner mainly did not mince words about the purpose of such cuts. It was to force refugees to move on and to take the right of return off the table. But it was also very telling the language that was used around refugees, which is very much the language of racist landlords in the United States. There was racist anti-poor language around welfare recipients, around being lazy and needing to move on. This economic pressure on Palestinians, both from Israel and the international donor community, is coupled with a very vigorous silencing campaign 
aimed to make it unacceptable to even speak about the Palestinian right of return. This can be seen clearly in the proposed IHRA definition, for example. And here it's interesting that the attempt is to make the defeat of the Palestinians absolutely total in not just accepting that the land was stolen, but also to even accept that we have no right to speak about um, the right of return or, or that history um, of theft. One of the basic tenets of organizing for the right of return, then I would say, is to consciously work against the silencing. The Palestinian right of return should be central to all solidarity activities and the knowledge produced by our movements must be grounded in the history of Palestinians with the voice of the most marginalized at the core, and that is Palestinian refugees. This means that the experience of al-Nakba must be kept up front with an emphasis on the continued displacement, fragmentation, and dispossession of the Palestinians. I am emphasizing this because in debates around the HIRA, in the UK, um, we, have some, we have had some uh, supposedly allies telling Palestinians um, that they should put the right of return off the table and not speak about the Nakba, go back to that uh, occupation only paradigm. But we have worked really hard over the past years to center Israel settler colonial projects logic and to explain uh, the Nakba. So it's asking us to go backwards to, uh, towards the Oslo frameworks is simply not an option. Centering the movement around the Palestinian historical reality really produces a different type of knowledge about what needs to be done. Mistakes happen when the lives of people a movement is supposed to be supporting are not seen. This is one of the reasons for the decline of solidarity movement during the 1990s, for example, with the rise of the Oslo Accords, the majority of Palestinians were suddenly excluded from the concerns of the liberation and solidarity activism. Because of the founding myths of a people without a land for a land without a people, and because the major aim of the Israeli settler colonial project is to render the Palestinian experience invisible, the Palestinians and the solidarity movement have to work twice as hard to bring out this experience. The flip side of ignoring the Palestinian right of return is its reduction to one of perpetual victimization. To some often well-meaning individuals, the Palestinian voice is there simply to recount suffering rather than to be a key agent of liberation. Organizing against silencing must not be based on tokenization of Palestinians or projecting an image of victimhood, but rather on solidarity and mutual respect. Organizing against silencing and centering the right of return is crucial. With the beginning of the second Palestinian Intifada in the North American context, which I was familiar with, there were renewed efforts to recenter the right of return. In North America, the Al Auda coalition was really instrumental to this. And to a large extent, the Palestinian led boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign has helped to center the right of return as a key demand of Palestinian civil society. The three demands of the call pertaining to the right of return and end to occupation and equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel speak to all sectors of Palestinian society, but also importantly center the right of return of Palestinian refugees. Fed up with the empty rhetoric and cheap condemnation of the violence on both sides, people began to feel that they had the power to make an impact. The campaign enabled unions, student groups, cultural and religious organizations to demonstrate a popular refusal to participate in and sustain the structures of racial discrimination and oppression. It helped to break the fragmented and stunted nature of Palestine solidarity work that tended to fall into the never ending response to Israeli massacres, rather than providing an alternative action to stop the massacres. On a very practical level, the campaign helped to answer the question, what action do we take after we have centered the Nakba and the right of return in our analysis and organizing? Having said all that, along with concerted efforts by Palestinian refugees to center the right of return in all organizing, I think there's an internal Palestinian conversation that needs to happen about the strategic orientation of the liberation movement as a whole. The narrow focus on building the infrastructures of a statelet in the hopes that Israel and international power brokers would grant some autonomy in return has clearly failed. 
The Palestinian Authority has become fluent in the language of human rights and UN resolutions, bids for statehood, as the situation on the ground keeps shifting to make even the most truncated form of autonomy impossible. This is not to diminish from the importance of being present at international fora, but the key issue is what are we doing and what is the strategy in these international fora. The maximum that we gain by returning for more resolutions is to add some numbers to a long list of numbers that have not helped to shift the status quo. To organize for the right of return necessitates a rethinking, revisioning of the Palestinian movement. One, this conversation is of course part and parcel of a campaign to democratize uh, Palestinian institutions, to democratize the Palestinian liberation organization and center the issue of representation, especially the representation of Palestinian refugees in Palestinian political structures. This is not easy. It is not a simple task, especially considering the fragmentation and economic dependence that exists. And I don't want to be naive here and think we can magic a new movement. I realize we are not in the global 60s moment um, and there is a large difference. But I do think there is a moment where social movements around the world are coming together and thinking of alternatives and thinking of change uh, beyond the status quo and what is given. And the Palestinian movement needs to be part and parcel of that reimagining um, of radicalism and radical movements for change at an international level. And on a final note, just to close, um, I want to stress that we need to rethink of the right of return and the new uh, movement for Palestinian rights um, in relation to the normalization moves that have been occurring on a, on a regional scale. One of the things that has happened, unfortunately, with the coming of the Oslo Accords is that Palestine has been fragmented and taken away from its regional context. But very clearly, authoritarianism today is working through the issue of Palestine, with normalization deals being cemented, cementing relations between authoritarian militarized regimes. And here we're speaking about the so-called Abraham Accords, for example, between the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Israel. So thus, to speak of liberation for Palestine, um, as historically was the position of the Palestinian movement, at least um, the left sides of it, is also to speak about liberation in the entire region, uh, liberation against authoritarian regimes that are unaccountable to their own population. So liberation for Palestine is also around ending the war in Yemen. It's also around the discussions of the Western Sahara. And we of course saw what happened uh, with the Moroccan normalization deal there. So part of reimagining return is also reimagining our orientation to our surroundings and not dividing Palestine out of its regional context. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you, Rafif. Again, brilliant presentation. At least, you, you know, you kind of summed up uh, the situation and what we need to be doing, but you also brought back this important point around um, solidarity, particularly in a regional context um, and in the context of uh, constant normalization. Uh, now you see it as, as someone who works on the media as being something that is uh, perpetrated by media as well. Um, now I invite Akram Salha, uh, Salhab, our last speaker today. Um, he is from Migrants Organize, and he's going to talk about countering the erasure of the Nakba, recentering Palestinian rights. Um, kind of works well with uh, what has been said so far. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dean, and thank you for everyone who organized uh, the event today. Um, I have the unenviable task of finishing off uh, today's wonderful conference with so many of the points um, that needed to be covered, already covered by previous speakers. So I might give a slightly truncated version of what I was going to say to avoid repetition. So I'm uh, speaking, I guess, in a capacity, firstly, as someone who um, works for migrant justice here in Britain, but at the same time as someone who's a Palestinian engaged in many of the discussions around the right of return, about strategy, about how we go about um, achieving these rights. So I wanted to um, bring in what I've 
what has been some of what's already been discussed today about some of the challenges to the traditional frameworks by which we undertake advocacy on organizing on the right of return and then speak about some of uh, the frameworks or approaches that I think would be really productive to returning to us to a strong framework of collective rights of Palestinians being at the forefront of how we speak and work and organize around Palestine. Um, and uh, I think I'll start by, I think I'll start by saying that, you know, when we talk about the Nakba and the right of return, this really means we're speaking about a vision of liberation, freedom, and obviously its connection with self-determination. Um, but lots of, lots of these rights of the Palestinian people and the cementation in international law and the articulation of them on the international stage was an achievement of the Palestine Liberation Organization in a previous period of revolutionary struggle who brought them to the fore and articulated Palestinian rights in that sense. And I think that framework, the right of return, national self-determination and the framework in international law, which overlaps with them is an achievement that we need to, first of all, obviously recognize and be prepared to defend in the work that we do. Um, and I think what's, uh, what, I'm, what I'm gonna focus on today is the fact that there has been in a variety of different ways, an erosion of some of this basic language around the cause of Palestine in activist circles within the solidarity movement and to a certain degree amongst Palestinians themselves. So I think understanding those, understanding the challenges we're now presented with and trying to avoid some of the pitfalls of the terminology we use, the language we employ and the strategies we take in our campaigns is of utmost importance for everyone concerned with advancing Palestinian rights. Um, and I think one of the first uh, frameworks that we find is, in, is, is, of, is of increasing use is the one around humanitarian, humanitarianism and human rights. So we see increasingly that when we talk about Palestine, there's uh, the framework of rights I was talking about is put to one side and there's a focus on only individual manifestations of um, injustice against Palestinians. And in certain contexts, as in every campaign, we run and we, organ we run campaigns and we organize around individual cases to protect individuals and to fight for justice and to exemplify the kinds of challenges we're facing. But this should really be done within the overall framework of international law and the, the rights of the Palestinian, the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. Unfortunately, there have been occasions when this has been diverted to speaking about very specific attempts to, um, you know, lobby the Israeli military occupation from afar in models that reduce what the Palestinian demands to simply uh, some advocacy model which has no chance of success against a belligerent colonial regime. Um, and I think the how this applies to campaigns and organiza organizations in Palestine and those outside differs, but it's something that we need to be really careful of, because one of the um, trajectories this takes us in is of uh, us talking about individual Palestinian rights, not as a collective camp, not as a, uh, a collective cause of national self determination. And linked to this is what we what we've often seen, which is a especially since the Oslo Accords in 1993, is a focus of, um, of advocacy, advocacy, solidarity and attention only on the West Bank and Gaza to the exclusion of Palestinian refugees living out of those areas or Palestinian refugees as Palestinian refugees and the right of return. And this obviously began, uh, this was accelerated considerably after the, the 1993 Oslo Accords, and that mapped onto an institutional marginalization of them within the structures of the PLO, but also a lessened focus by solidarity organizations on Palestinian organizations in exile. And this has some, this has increasingly mapped on to a discussion of uh, what, I, what you could call the, um, the identity politics encroaching on the Palestinian context in speaking about lived experience on the ground in West Bank and Gaza as somehow being priority or exclude, excluding the experience of Palestinian refugees living elsewhere in the world. And we really need to return to a discussion of Palestinians, the, the status of refugee as a, as a political status and as Palestinians being equal in their different um, 
sectors in their different areas and not trying to claim that one area of Palestine has priority over Palestinians living elsewhere. And one of the most egregious manifestations of this was the statehood question and the statehood initiatives that were pushed um, over the past few years by the leadership. And there was, and was supported in, uh, by solidarity organizations in the diaspora um, and obviously solidarity organizations in the West. And there was a certain degree at the time of a sense that, well, there's, there's certain advantages that this will give us such that we're willing to sacrifice other Palestinian rights or frameworks of speaking about of Palestine. But what that's effectively done is it's brought the focus of um, discussion to the question of statehood, supporting statehood being um, a proxy for supporting Palestine at the exclusion of talking about the right of return and national self-determination. And, um, uh, and, and then Palestinian refugees and the right of return and what happened in 1948 being excluded entirely from this framework. And I think we can, the biggest example, the biggest um, example of how Palestinians are being excluded from this framework was, in, was within the statehood initiatives itself, in which they were very careless. Um, uh, there was very, there was a great deal of disregard for Palestinian refugees, how they would be included in the future of representative institutions at the United Nations, but also whatever state of Palestine were to be created, how they would be incorporated, involved in that. And the very complicated legal debates around that did not satisfy the basic um, demands of Palestinians, which is to be equal under an equal representative in the United Nations and elsewhere as a basis for a renewal of the PLO as a national representative of the Palestinian people. Um, and I think this, this is part and parcel of, you know, we talk about the, the marginalization of the right of return in Palestinian history, but crucially, we're also talking about the marginalization of Palestinians themselves. And I think over the past years, we've seen the devastation to Palestinian camps in Syria. We've seen uh, Palestinian camps in Lebanon and the immense political and economic pressure that's led to an exodus from the camps. Um, and and th this has taken place with various degrees of coverage, but largely, you know, um, largely under, uh, in a way that's generally been invisibilized and the principal victims of the ethnic cleansing in 1948, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian refugees being invisibilized. And really, um, when we talk about uh, Palestinian liberation, the engine of this has been the Palestinian camps, especially during the revolutionary period in Syria uh, and in Lebanon. And what we're struggling to contend with, we're going to need to contend with now as Palestinians, is the fact that these two locations which were engines of the revolution have suffered this considerable blow and attack and decimation. And um, meaning that the, the way we think about the right of return will need to shift in terms of strategy and in terms of how we uh, work with and engage with um, the people now know further, further away from Palestine than we were before, simply. Um, and I think, and Rafif, uh, I think Abit touched on this as well, <laughs> is the question of the context in which we find ourselves in here in the UK. And that's uh, this of this de delegitimization campaigns that are taking place against Palestinians and Palestinian history. Um, and I wanna talk about um, the, specifically about the IHRA definition, which specifically prohibits speaking about the state of Israel as a racist endeavor. Um, but of course, the racist endeavor and the racist intent and the practices were evident in the establishment of the state of Israel when Zionist militias ethnic, ethnically cleansed more than 700,000 Palestinians from their home. So the clear target of this, of this definition is to forbid legal analyses that highlight the apartheid nature of the state of Israel as a racist endeavor, but also to deny the facts of what happened to Palestinians in 1948. And I think in this respect, we ought to regard and understand the, uh, the IHRA as akin to laws in other countries that prohibit speaking about historical um, massacres or historical uh, genocides, such as those laws in Turkey, which uh, work to deny and silence that historical experience. Um, and of, the reason I'm kind of going running through these different factors, I think are important because that brings us to some central points, I think, of how we need to be thinking about responding to this. So one of the discussions we've heard today is how we maintain and rehearse 
this anti-colonial framing um, that we've been discussing and what this means in both our academic work and in our campaigning work. Um, so I think we really need to ensure that we talk about Palestine within this accurate historical context of colonialism, but also within a frame of anti-colonial struggle, one that sits naturally and is connected to the anti-racist and anti-colonial struggles within the countries we're living and elsewhere of which were and of which um, Palestine is an inseparable part of the story and in this struggle. And if we think of it in that context, we also have to understand, and Britain, of course, was complicit in what happened in Palestine um, from 1917 to 1948, and obviously until today, and its continued support for Israel. But I think we need to understand that there's a general aversion to speaking about colonial history. And as that's beginning to change in Britain, at least, we find that the, the discussion on Palestine is definitely being pushed in the other direction, principally because we're not dealing with a historical colonial situation, we're dealing with um, a live colonial situation, which has implications when we speak about the history, about what we should do moving forward. So I think we have to focus and understand that we need renewed efforts at education within this broader anti-colonial um, framework of the Black Lives Matter movement and others that we that have begun to gain traction here. Um, and I think the other important point is that how we speak about Palestinian history. So one of the um, one of the I think it was Abid earlier was speaking about this thing of discussing things as a Palestinian perspective or from a Palestinian narrative, which is of course dangerous because it suggests that I, that this is a Palestinian point of view rather than documented historical fact. Um, and uh, and the other, the other side of this in discussions that have taken place in Britain are that, um, are that when we're being challenged about what we can and can't say about Palestine, one of the responses has been to discuss uh, the free, our freedom of speech under law in the British context. And oftentimes discussing freedom of speech, unfortunately, can divert us into a framework in which Palestine, and this is what happened has happened to Palestine under the prevent legislation is rendered extreme or controversial. So in Britain's prevent legislation, it's their countering violent extremism program. They've included Palestine as one of the examples of extremist speech and controversy. And the purpose of that isn't always to ban Palestine events, but it's to say that this area of discussion ought to be monitored and um, examined for as a possible indicator of extremism. So even, so some on the call will know that events have been canceled, speakers um, have been forced to change, neutral chairs imposed on events, various restrictions taking place in academic settings around that. Um, but also the events that do take place are rendered or placed in this category of extreme or controversial. So we have these two challenges. One is uh, pigeonholing Palestine, Palestinian history as a Palestinian perspective or some Palestinian narrative akin and equal in weight to the Israeli official history about the Nakba in particular, but other incidents in our history, which we need to contest because it's historically inaccurate, but also misrepresents what happened to us in, in the past and therefore misrepresents the rights that we're advocating and, and campaigning and organizing for. On the other hand, we have this uh, question of being pigeonholed as extreme or controversial, which um, delegitimizes what you have to say before you even can open your mouth. So I think part of what we need to be thinking about when we respond to attacks by the IHRA, by prevent legislation, by other attempts to delegitimize our work, is to ground it in historical and present fact and reality, which means making visible Palestinian history, also making visible the Palestinian present, the people, what's taking place, and all the different manifestations, both inside of Palestine and outside. Um, and I think we, we have to reaffirm in very basic ways the right of return and national, national self-determination and talk about the um, inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. And I know this might sound obvious, but there's lots of times where press releases, organizing um, initiatives, frameworks begin from a completely different set of rights, such that what we're talking about in terms of Palestine is completely obscured. And I think we really need to ensure um, and be aware that outside of some of the circles we operate in and work in, 
a lot of these arguments and discussions are not understood. It's only articulated in a very vague way. So I think we need to make crystal clear that the cause of Palestine is a cause of displaced and dispossessed people struggling for their inalienable rights, that we are refugees and that the right of return and the cause of Palestinian refugees is completely inseparable from the cause of Palestine more generally. It is the cause of Palestine. Um, and I think the final point, which some have touched on a little bit, but I think it's central to some of the discussion, internal discussion amongst Palestinians relates to how how and why we have found ourselves in this situation. And I think there's lots of um, talk of the different ways in which the economic analysis, or there's lots of um, analysis of how the economic situation in Palestine has restricted and limited Palestinians uh, from expressing them, from uh, struggling for their rights, how the donor regime has limited what we can say, what we can do and how we can organize. Um, but there's, of course, this parallel political story of how Palestinian refugees have been excluded from the PLO, which, of course, is a crisis of representation on the one hand, but it's also um, a crisis in, in organizing terms as the majority of Palestinians have no representation and are not included in their own national uh, structures. And this exclusion as a result of the Oslo Accords is the reason, is one of the chief reasons why the the center of gravity of Palestinian politics, politics has shifted to the West Bank and Gaza and what's happening in Lebanon and Syria and other countries of Palestinian diaspora, the egregious crimes that are committed against our people, the apartheid regime, I think others were describing um, the Palestinians in the Gulf live in, in many instances. All of these things are put on the back burner and not seen and not discussed. And the way to overcome that is this reform of our national institutions, the Palestine Liberation Organization through elections to its national parliament, the Palestine National Council. And this has been a demand of Palestinian refugee communities for a very long time, alongside the examples we've heard of today, of people physically marching to the border, of um, repeated attempts by Palestinian refugees to return home, but the return of refugees is also returned to our national institutions, their recreation so they can represent the collective will of the Palestinian people, and on that basis, we can renew a truly collective struggle um, to ensure that the Palestine is prioritized again, which it would be if all Palestinians were included. It would be right up the national agenda and our organizing um, and our struggle could renew itself on that basis. So I really look forward to the discussion and thank you again for everyone to organize, to organize this wonderful event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akram. That was great uh, and also made us think a lot about a certain issue and recentering the debate as, uh, um, as, as was talked about this morning. Um, I think one of the questions that seem to have come through the, uh, the, the, the questions and answers is a question around, you know, when we talk about refugees, are we also talking about uh, people in exile or in diaspora? So perhaps maybe one of you can answer that. And then I have a specific question to Mesna um, in the chat, uh, which is, um, a question related to uh, when you talk about returning, um, how do we teach and embody the right of return in academic spaces and institutions when these spaces are constantly subject to censorship and distortion? For instance, the occupier controls what gets to be included in the Palestinian curriculum for primary and secondary students. So anyone from uh, the other speak uh, speakers, Amaisoon or, um, or Akram or, um, uh, Rafif can talk about, you know, when we talk about refugees, are we also including uh, the um, exilic Palestinians or Palestinians in diaspora? Not to, um, you know, not to try and, 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 and kind of say, you know, or kind of impose differences, but perhaps just to clarify uh, for, this, for the audience. Uh, would anyone like to come and answer that question? Or Mesna, do you want to come in? I mean, Hi, Mesna. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, Akram. Well, I'm just going to say, uh, yeah, the, you know, this is the point I was making, which is that the status as a refugee is a, is a political designation and tied to a certain set of rights. And irrespective of if you're living in awful conditions in Syria or you're living in Orange County in the United States, so um, yeah, in, th these rights um, are enjoyed, I say enjoyed, um, uh, 
pa Palestinians have these rights, irrespective of whether, irrespective of where they are exactly. So some are classified under them, come under UNRWA under the under the Article One D, which is the exclusion of Palestinian refugees from Article One D. Um, so they fall under UNRWA's mandate, but other other Palestinians, in different ways, have different protections under international law. But it's not restricted to living in a camp or just being in the vicinity of Palestine. Rafif, do you want to come in before I go to um, Mesna to answer the question specific to her? No, I think Akram covered it. Mesna, can you come in? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, for the question and also I would I would also say and make clear that there is this often this idea of those in exile or in the broader Shatat somehow quote unquote more privileged than those more formalized as refugees and I think we need to remember that it is that is quite inaccurate there are you know in, in, in addition to those refugees in the region that are outside the UNRWA protection gap those in the Shatat have also experienced incredible repression, um, not only in the, you know, sort of Iraq or, or um, Egypt or Libya, um, but including the United States, where the, you know, there's this idea often that, you know, the, the Palestinian, um, there, certainly there are certain forms of privilege that come from other kinds of citizenship, but there has been, um, incredible levels of repression, of silencing, of incarceration of Palestinians because they're Palestinians and because they choose to exercise and speak for Palestinian rights in the diaspora. So I just kind of want to make that clear that this idea of the discourse of privilege that sometimes circulates around how we talk about Palestinians in the Shatat really needs to be pushed back on and challenged. Um, so to the question about um, how do we teach and embody the right of return in academic spaces, institutions, when these, I'm not sure if the questioner is asking about in Palestine or outside of Palestine. Um, so because they also say the occupier controls what gets to be included um, in the Palestinian curriculum for primary and secondary students. Um, this is not a new problem. This is an old problem, right? This is since the occupation. In fact, since the British mandate, um, Palestinians have never had uh, what I like to call a self-determined curriculum. Um, so ever since the sort of beginnings of the formations and the thinking around once, you know, Palestinian national identity, um, one of the main instruments, which is education, has never been fully availed to Palestinians as the site for their the building of their political national consciousness. Um, but yet here we are, and yet here are Palestinians. How does that happen? And I think part of, part of the, the, the question around education is that teachers and students find other forms through which to convey and think about and build collective study um, on Palestine uh, amongst each other. Uh, and you see this through what I was talking about in terms of alternative schooling, um, um, schooling outside of formalized structures, the kind of fugitive practices of teachers even within the classroom where they talk about Palestine without even talking about Palestine. Um, the occupier has never been completely successful in controlling Palestinian um, self-articulation and self uh, and collective study within both formal and informal spaces. Um, and I think also the, the uh, in terms of outside, it's, it's, it's really similar in that sense. <laughs> Palestinian, um, you know, I always attempt to think about and work through and work around um, the, the sort of repressive systemic um, carceral practices of states and um, you know anti-Palestinian discourses um, around them. Thank you very much. There's a big question here at the beginning, which is a question from Malik, uh, which says, uh, for all the revolution, uh, resolutions that have been made around the right of return, the question is when interna when international institution has why haven't international institutions put 
restrictive orders for limited return of Palestinian refugees, uh, then, you know, they're closing the door for, for uh, discussion. I think that is, if you could clarify your question later on, Malik, because it's not very clear here, but I think you are talking, um, and correct me if I'm right, you're talking about, uh, you know, international organizations not following up on, uh, agree on 194, Resolution 194. Uh, so if we, if I may, I can return to that later on uh, with the, with the uh, organizers. Um, but again, a question around um, how can we teach and embody the right of return in academic spaces and institutions when these spaces are constantly subject to censorship and distortion. Uh, so, uh, Musna, again, that's a question to you, if you could answer it while uh, we go on to the other questions. Um, I, I suppose I did really, in a sense that, you know, I, the, the, there is this sense that these, these kinds of, there is bravery that is required to speak on behalf of Palestine. There is something that has to accept the fact that there will, you are fighting a fight and that fight has consequences and it must be fought. You know, there's all these kinds of things around the, and, 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 and one of the most important ways Palestinians can do so within the academy is to ingather with allies and ingather with quite, you know, Palestine, there is a kind of Palestinian self-exceptionalism that happens that says, you know, we are the only ones who are repressed in the academy. And that is simply not true. And there is, there are different scales through which Palestinian scholars can uh, work with others around conditions within their own university as the site of struggle and then outside their university um, and, and do so with others, with kindred spirits, with other scholars and colleagues thinking about similar questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, this following question to Rafif. It's a question that says, do you believe it will be the union between different international solidarity movements that will create enough pressure to push for the implementation of return? And what will happen to the refugee camps that have been such important historical sites over the decades? Could they be maintained as anti-monuments or extended enforced exile? Um, I'm just quoting the question as it came. Rafif, would you like to answer that around uh, international solidarity movements? Sure. Um, I think this is why I tried to separate my talk in terms of the internal Palestinian conversation that needs to happen around reimagining what our anti-colonial struggle looks like, um, shifting the discourse from the Oslo Accord. I, I cannot think of any other accord that has been declared dead so many times, um, yet we still live under its restrictions, we still live under its rules. So I think without Palestinians being clear about what it is that's being demanded, it's actually very confusing for international solidarity movements um, to be able to, to also have a coherent framework. Boycotts, divestments, and sanctions have helped us as a campaign in the last period um, to try and link all sections of Palestinian society together, to try and center the right of return. Um, but I think that we need something a lot more, a lot deeper as a transformation to, to refigure this. Um, and here there's also the link to the regional level as well. Um, sometimes think, people think international solidarity is just around like Western social movements, but I think there's a connection to the region that we have really lost um, and need to rethink um, how, how to fit in with, with what's happening on the regional level. If you think of the Arab uprisings, for example, um, you know, where was Palestine to that? If you think about the new normalization deals, um, the waves of refugees that keep being created in the region. Um, as for refugee camps as monuments or what happens with them when there is return, I think that's, that's a very difficult question to answer because I think a lot, many of these things happen in practice. Um, it is a discussion and a political debate. But coming from a refugee family myself, I know that these are not simply camps. Um, these are people's homes, people's memories, people's childhoods um, are spent in these in these homes. So it would almost be like a second ethnic cleansing if we're like, okay, everyone, let's wipe out the camps. Um, and these are very technical questions we need to think about because it also has to do with property 
Um, if we're thinking about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, for example, there would be many that are very happy to clear out these camps to use that as property and property development. Um, so I think it's a much, much broader question that is a, is a political question when, when it comes to the organizing itself and that moment where hopefully, um, you know, we are able to get on the buses and go somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Akram, I have two related questions to you. Can you, uh, are there any efforts in the UK to pressure the government to discredit the new Israeli ambassador um, and uh, who has said uh, that the Nakba is a lie? And again, um, again, another question, can you speak about the circulation of Palestinian celebrities, academics, PLO adjacent that have limited and delimited the parameters of our uh, conversations and demands that are made visible and public. So in a sense, thinking about maybe a question of uh, the way that we, you know, some Palestinians can discredit or limit uh, conversations around rights and the right to return. Uh, yeah, on, on the ambassador point, this was a um, quite a revealing point that was made by the new Israeli ambassador here in London on a call uh, for Hanukkah um, in which she presents, she spoke about the Palestinian as Palestinian Nakba as a, a colossal line of fabrication. And um, it's a relief, obviously, in some sense to hear her say it publicly, because this is what we've been experiencing in terms of the pressure and the um, uh, and the, the delegitimization efforts that we've been confronted with here in the UK, at least when the Israeli ambassador comes out and says it very boldly, you can see very simply um, that this is the objective. And obviously, of course, long has been the objective of subsequent Israeli regimes and others to make sure that the Nakba is not spoken about. And, you know, there was all the um, discussion when the new historians discovered many of the facts of history about our dispossession and our displacement in 1948. And the overwhelming Palestinian response to that was, of course, pleased that they would, that this had been documented in greater detail, but was facts which Palestinian historians and, of course, Palestinians themselves had experienced and was available um, on the public record for anyone who cared to look at it. So we've had this long history of attempts to turn what happened in Palestine in 1948 to discredit the right of return. You know, people even say, oh, well, they fled, they fled their homes. Well, even if Palestinians fled their homes, they are, they're entitled to the right of return. But of course, all of this, this is not a discussion which is about international law or actually trying to find a solution. It's one which is aimed at discrediting the right of return by silencing um, this history. And this is not something that anyone's gonna be taking any action against the Israeli prime minister for. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that won't register with anyone in the political arena, I don't think. Um, but it's part of this much broader effort. And as I say, it's just a clear articulation of the problem um, as it's manifest itself today in Britain and has for many years. I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on the, the question of kind of the, the delegitimization or the, the um, downplaying of the Palestinian right of return amongst celebrities of PLO and others. I think what's really important to understand is that a lot of the um, things that we witness happening in the media and many things that are said by Palestinian individuals in that arena is a manifestation of a collective problem, which is a dismantling of our national institutions and a question, as Dr. Um, as Professor Carmen Abulsi will always speak about, about representation and representation of the, uh, the mass of the Palestinian people and the will of the Palestinian people. And so if you don't have that, you, of course, have individuals within our institutions or celebrities or others trying to either nefariously undercut those rights because they have an individual um, financial interest in doing so, or people in a tough situation trying to make the best of a bad situation and thinking maybe some statehood initiative or maybe this other way of going about it will be what, what we need in order to continue the struggle, absent a mass popular movement absent a national liberation movement which can actually do so through different means and methods and um, that will be the discussion of Palestinians within that arena about how we go about that and how we employ that. So I think 
it is just it's it's really a symptom of an institutional failure that we're confronted with um and you know this is not something that disagreed on by the majority of palestinians and unfortunately you know one voice here or there doesn't make the voice and the will and the rights of millions of people go away so obviously it's frustrating to see that but that it's not something you know we Palestinians will disagree on many um, different things but we don't disagree on this these are our rights and the rights of our people and the people who disagree are a very tiny minority who are there for the reasons i've just outlined thank you and i think you answered a, a question which i might uh, pose to me soon which is how can palestinians demonstrate their struggle as one colonial struggle when they don't agree on one um, one particular way of liberating Palestine. If you don't feel you want to answer that question very soon, then don't. But I thought I, I would like to bring you into the question and answer sessions. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Akhil and Akram might be better place to answer this question than me or Monday. Okay. Uh, Rafif, Rafif, do you want to come in? Sorry. How can. Um, yeah, when Palestinians do, do not have one voice and, and so on, how can we present it as as a, a struggle against settler colonialism or colonial practices, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, this is precisely why um, the question of democratization and representation comes up. I mean, certainly Palestinians are not a monolithic. Um, there are different, uh, you know, variations of opinion. There's also different political stripes from left to right, but there. At the same time, there are historical demands um, that, ha that have been constituted and continue to constitute the core of Palestinian liberation. So even those most connected to this concept of having a two-state solution or having any kind of autonomy um, cannot outright deny that Palestinians have a right of return. Those basic demands have not really been diluted and it's actually a testament to the Palestinian people that despite all of this international pressure, economic pacification, wars, um, those demands have not, have not been erased. Will it magically happen and come about that there's a new Palestinian strategy? No, it's, that's a question of political work, putting frameworks together, having conferences like this to have the discussions and the debates. Um, but again, I want to make the distinction between what is an internal Palestinian conversation around our particular movement, how to put demands forward um, versus the international solidarity conversation. I mean, those are not separate. They are, of course, connected. But I personally, I think there's a bit of Palestinian internal house cleaning um, that needs to happen desperately fast. Thank you. Um, I think we have answered most of the questions. So. Uh, in, in kind of uh, Dania, who wanted to clarify her question uh, around the discourse, not specific to return of uh, return of refugees uh, and the differences in the Palestinian voice around that, and then um, in the context of I think if I if I interpreted correctly, in the context of the question about the celebrities and the uh, you know political. Uh, people um, on on the kind of institutional political uh, spectrum. I think uh, I think what what Daniel wanted to say is there is a prioritization of certain voices. Um, but again, if we go back to the context of uh, this uh, this uh, day's conference, uh, it's to recenter uh, the right of return as a, a political language. I think that has came across very clearly. Uh, all throughout, but uh, you know, uh, but I'm going to invite the organizers now, as we don't have any more questions, and to thank uh, this last panel for such a brilliant, um, you know, very important uh, discussions. Uh, but Nimer, um, and then Abed, and also Reem, if you could kindly come back and, and uh, uh, wrap up. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dina. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, Abed. Excellent. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna give a summation 
uh, of this uh, wonderful conference that uh, uh, we all participated in today. Uh, it was a great pleasure to uh, organize it with uh, Nimr and Dream. And uh, I really enjoyed the fact that we were able to bring in so many uh, different perspectives from so many Palestinian and Arab scholars uh, in this uh, long day of discussion. Now, the first panel was an inquiry into colonialism and its outcomes. I started by focusing on the coloniality of the Palestine question uh, and the colonial frameworks facilitation of the removal of the native population and the rhetorical strategies that are utilized to prevent the return of the Palestinian people. Return is of course, uh, both uh, prevented by uh, colonial might, but it is also justified by appeals to ride through uh, seven rhetorical and conceptual aggressions against the Palestinian people. We have legalism, denialism, depoliticization, transactional logics, both sidism, discursive suppression, and criminalization. The latter two are most clearly evident in the current struggle over the IHRA definition. Uh, implicitly, uh, I was calling here for a new historiography and a new political discourse that is based on a shift in frameworks, language, and morality in the face of this attempt to criminalize and suppress uh, the Palestinian uh, struggle. The new discourses should be based on the notion of promoting return as the only pathway to anti-colonial liberation. Any other course of action ranging from standing on the sidelines, seeking to prevent return or trying to limit the ways in which it is imagined and implemented would serve racist colonial considerations based on the idea of establishing an Israeli colonial rather than a democratic anti-colonial state in historic Palestine. And it's very important, I think, throughout this conference, it was highlighted by multiple uh, uh, scholars that um, we must imagine an anti-colonial future in Palestine. There is no other way forward. The current situation is unsustainable. The expulsion of an entire people from its land is unsustainable, unacceptable. We should never accept it. Now, Osama Maqdisi engaged at a deep level with the different political and discursive layers that undergirded the colonial project in Palestine, starting from the fact that two rights, right of returns had existed. A Palestinian one based on modern dispossession of home and land within living memory and this was a right of return enshrined in international law and based on uh, UN resolutions. Um, uh, uh, and it was in total contrast with uh, the Zionist so-called right of return, the claim of an inherent Jewish right to Palestine that had emerged in Europe in the 19th century, as Professor Mahdisi showed, enjoyed British colonial support throughout the mandate period, and since then became an essential aspect of the state of Israel. And suppression of the first right and the actualization of the second illustrated the pervasive and persistent uh, colonial prevarication that the Palestinian people were subjected to in the service of the Zionist movement, but of course carried out by the British administration. Professor Maghdisi showed through a close reading of the principles enshrined in the charter of the British mandate uh, that these principles had a foundational Zionist nature and mission. The Nakba, he argued, was already implied in the terms of the mandate. And the logic of, uh, that led to the Nakba persisted in the Peel Commission uh, report, in the UN partition plan and elsewhere. Ultimately, this racialized and colonial vision uh, that underlined an international legal and political order over which Palestinians had no control resulted in the expulsion of our people from their homeland. Dr. Anne Erfan illustrated and discussed the significance of the emergence of UNRWA after our people were expelled from their homeland, both uh, as a project of containment of Palestinian refugees, but also as an important organization that is currently threatened by a combined Israeli-US assault led by Trump and his ideologically Zionist son-in-law, Jared Kushner. She illustrated the flaws in ahistorical characterizations of UNRWA, which are currently used uh, as part of this assault. These denied the fact that it was a versatile site that was used by refugees towards their own empowerment. She illustrated that by through examining a range of petitions uh, from uh, Camp Mukhtars and various other fascinating material. But also that site 
which was uh, a site of empowerment, a site of contestation, a site of demonstrations, a site of protest, was also used against refugees with an eye towards their disenfranchisement. And uh, this was perhaps the original um, intention uh, that uh, behind setting up this site. The British and the Americans and the European powers did not pump uh, so much money into this project because they cared about Palestinian refugees. It was beca because they cared about anti-communism. It was because they cared about uh, preventing uh, radical movements from emerging. And it was because as, as Dr. Erfan showed, they were seeking uh, to uh, resettle the Palestinian refugees and thus destroy the potential of their return. However, all of these attempts at resettlement and all of these attempts at uh, suppressing the right of return could not completely change the legal order around international refugee law, a subject that uh, uh, Dr. Ardim says uh, discussed in great depth. Um, in a sober factual presentation and with reference to relevant international law, he discussed the legal reasoning that other underlined the right of return. He not only referred to resolutions particular to the expulsion, denationalization, and appropriation of property of Palestinian refugees, but also to broader international humanitarian laws that are applicable universally. Now, the Americans, the Israelis, the Europeans, have often tried to undermine uh, laws that uh, specifically speak about Palestinians or to reinterpret them uh, in, in ways uh, that uh, disenfranchise Palestinians and harm them. However, there are other international laws that Dr. Amsayas referred to that apply everywhere, and these are difficult to tackle. They are, they are difficult to uh, remove. The Palestine problem as a whole therefore uh, was affected by this legal order. And at its heart was the right, right of return as al Mseis uh, demonstrates. Dr. Mseis uh, closed this discussion with insisting that our collective responsibility remains to keep the struggle for dignity and justice alive, especially when it comes to the rights of refugees who are at the heart of the Palestine uh, um, cause and international law is one avenue for uh, carrying that torch. Dr. Nimr Sultani, followed by a focus on internal colonialism and internal displacement. And this made sense, um, you know, given uh, the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Mseis established the overall legal framework, uh, it was only appropriate that Dr. Sultani would look at uh, a specific application, which is that of uh, the uh, internally displaced Palestinians within 1948 Palestine. Often that section of the Palestinian people is ignored. And uh, even though their number is quite sizable, there are more than 340,000 uh, Palestinians that were internally displaced within 1948 Palestine. The collective efforts to nationalize and internationalize uh, their cause uh, through mobilization were discussed by Dr. Sultani. He refuted also different logics that justify their dispossession, uh, espe especially the security logic that is often utilized to prevent uh, Palestinian uh, return in this and other cases. As we know uh, from various presentations in this conference, securitization is a persistent uh, method of uh, trying to suppress uh, Palestinians and to control them and oppress them. Above all, Dr. Sultani used the case of the IDPs as a vantage point from which to illustrate the limits to legalism under conditions of settler colonization, highlighting the flows uh, of the logic that Palestinians have rights in the land, but not rights over the land. Sahar Francis moved on to highlight uh, the legal implications of Israeli colonization in Jerusalem and the ways by which it promoted Jewish supremacy in Jerusalem and pushed Palestinians out of the city. Uh, Francis uh, focused especially on the residency question, uh, which is key to the ability of Palestinians to remain in their city. She looked at how 
using a litany of Israeli laws, the residency status of Jerusalemites was regularly revoked, even when existing Israeli laws prevented the revocation uh, uh, of residency on such dubious grounds as national allegiance, judgments were often delayed and laws were, were often revised. Uh, and this was all to enable an effective form of incremental uh, ethnic cleansing and complete demographic transformation in this city. So uh, the question of Jerusalem was uh, discussed from that legal and angle where also uh, Sahar Francis, uh, through her experience as a, as a legal practitioner in the city and elsewhere in Palestine, referred to specific cases that illustrated what this means for people's lives. Uh, it's incredibly destructive what is going on, and listening to her was a powerful reminder uh, of the fact that we're not just talking here about concepts and ideas and things that happened in the past. We are talking about uh, an, a daily challenge that affects people in their daily lives. Millions of Palestinians are affected by this. Professor Zilber Ashkar surveyed different visions of return that were articulated by Palestinian leaderships and the ways they conceptualize the place of settler colonists, arguing that bourgeois conceptions dominate discussions of return due to a focus on individual property rights and to a lack of vision of a vision that could accommodate the colonist presence within the territory. He suggested that some, in some historical instances, such a vision existed. Um, however, uh, often it was absent. Um, against the idea of uh, individual uh, notions of uh, return, he advocated for a collective settlement of returnees. Uh, this led to a vibrant discussion, of course, uh, whereby Nimr Sultani highlighted the collective nature of the right to return when approached politically and not only legally. And uh, Professor Ashkar uh, responded by highlighting that the definition of a bourgeois right is related to the nature of property itself. Um, so, uh, and, and the fact that uh, any future compensation should be done on an egalitarian basis. There was a very vibrant discussion there, open, and I'm glad that we had it because we have to uh, actually talk about uh, different visions uh, of return uh, and to remind people that any discussion of the right of return in a conference like this or in any other conference, if it's not going to be an anti-Palestinian discussion, has to be centered actually on maximizing people's empowerment and rights, not putting limits on them uh, and not uh, uh, preventing their full articulation. So we should, we should always start from a maximalist position and continue to be committed uh, towards that. Um, unlike, of course, uh, the different political logics that are discussed uh, in other parts of this conference, and we're going to get to them now, uh, that start from the position of trying to deny Palestinian rights and they want to diminish uh, uh, their scale uh, Dr. Mazna Khatu gave us a great service by talking about how Palestinians themselves imagine their rights and more importantly, practice their way. She spoke of return as act and the infraction, the idea that uh, um, the Palestinians are taught return completely runs against the reality that their very first act of Palestinian refugee children in the 1950s and so on was to attempt to return home. You know, fresh out of the Nakba, you had all these kids trying to do that. These acts and infractions against uh, colonial uh, boundaries and space were countered by instruments that were used to criminalize Palestinian attempts to return. Dr. Qatu also highlighted the fact that there were attempts of viewing return through the lens of a, a curriculum and experimentation in the curriculum. Schooling happened despite, not because of institutions that were set up to school Palestinians schooling on return. 
So there was this incredible cur curricular effort, effort that she described based on uh, the Nakba as an important pedagogical process that was experienced in people's lives and they didn't need it to uh, learn about in systematic ways. She posited the idea of a continual insistence on tomorrow Palestine, a progressive idea of Palestine, an insistence that she traced historically uh, in uh, the Palestinian educational sphere. She moreover highlighted return as a form of collective study. Um, done through the historic and multiple ways through which Palestinians, um, and this is her term, ingather in universities across the Arab world and abroad to express the possibilities of return. And in this, through this ingathering, they were building historic institutions that brought them together, the foremost example being uh, GUPS. As such, the achievement of the right of return, Dr. Khato suggests, is it takes place through its constant enactment and reenactment um, and through a constant uh, um, clinging to the idea that the homeland is the future. Uh, uh, the right of return is one to a future that Palestinians uh, are already making. Now, in, in contrast to this future making that, uh, that uh, Dr. Khatu uh, discussed so elaborately, um, Dr. Maysoon Sukariya investigated how the cultural, how, how the cultural industry of uh, what she called contrarian entrepreneurs operated. You know, these are uh, people who are engaged in contrarian ideas, but towards inter entrepreneurial ends. Uh, the, the, such entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial researchers proliferated in many uh, Palestinian sites, including the camps of Le Lebanon, upon which Dr. Sukaria focuses her study. She traced how such researchers are in line, are always in line with uh, au ideas and the latest fads and fashions. In the 1990s, there was a hype uh, around uh, the study of the right to return and refugees due to Oslo. However, this mellowed down after 9-11, as Dr. Sukaria showed. Uh, the new discourses were focused in the 2000s, focused on uh, uh, the need uh, to liberate Palestinians from their Palestinian identities. In her fascinating paper, um, uh, Dr. Sukaria showed how much of this was couched in the language of researcher humanitarians and academic infatuation uh, with what is new uh, and what is different led to a, a renewed focus or a new focus on doubting Palestinian intentions to return home, attributing the commitment to, to, of the right, towards the right of return to the PLO, the Lebanese state, everybody essentially, but the refugees themselves. Everybody wants them to go back except for themselves. She showed also that there was a second process going on, which is the focus on uh, private versus public articulations on the part of refugees. The premise uh, of uh, this discourse is that Palestinians have to perform their Palestinianness in public and that the right of return is just used for that purpose. Dr. Sukaria critiques the very dichotomy between public and, and private and subjects it to close scrutiny. She shows that it is used to prevent people from art articulating and achieving their rights uh, rather than uh, uh, for the purpose of empowering them. A third set of writings that she identifies on uh, is on a focus on Palestinian identity and sense of home. Again, uh, using the fact that Palestinian refugees sometimes uh, love their current environment and express love for the communities and the countries they live in. Uh, and therefore, this is used to suggest that uh, they are uninterested in Palestine. All of these discourses, these three different uh, uh, schools of writing, um, have, uh, are enabled by a regime of pressures and incentives that Dr. Sukaria um, identifies. And uh, these are uh, extremely uh, harmful and problematic for Palestinian refugees and their rights. However, uh, they are very useful for getting grants uh, and for uh, claiming novelty. <clears throat> 
Rafif Ziyadeh, Dr. Rafif, offered a powerful critique of other types of models that operate. If, if Dr. Maysun Sukkariya had focused on the anthropological level, um, Dr. Ziyade focused on the conflict resolution um, studies field and, uh, and the political science models that, per, uh, that permeate uh, the public sphere nowadays. Uh, these models are premised on the idea of return as a stumbling block and on the idea of exchanged uh, concessions uh, made through the facilitation of uh, honest brokers and so on and so forth. Um, despite the, the, the language uh, of compromise, she showed that actually um, this whole language was also connected to a very active project of economic pacification uh, accompanied by attempts to criminalize expression of the right of return uh, through silencing uh, political campaigns. Uh, the liquidation of the right of return uh, in uh, Dr. Ziada's paper is uh, connected to uh, everyday economic realities uh, that are faced by the Palestinian people and the political structures uh, um, to which these economic realities could be traced. Where, for example, she mentioned the case of the families of martyrs uh, in refugee camps in Lebanon, Gaza, Syria, and elsewhere, who currently have to suffer uh, from the cuts to the uh, PA budget. The strangulation of the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, therefore, uh, acts as a, also a strangulation of refugees, challenging the notion that you could ever separate uh, the uh, occupied territories uh, from the Shatat. The cuts to UNRWA also uh, are affecting Palestinians across uh, the, uh, uh, the region. And uh, as Dr. Ziad noted, um, this is part of a very clear agenda uh, that ties the economic with the political, that sees uh, economic siege and strangulation uh, as one pathway uh, towards undermining the return of the Palestinian people. Um, Racist uh, uh, discourses uh, are utilized to justify this process, especially in the uh, most recent uh, Trumpian era. Uh, um, Dr. Ziade uh, traced the utilization of anti-poor language, for example, against Palestinian refugees, um, the framing uh, their plight in relation to welfare and handouts and so on and so forth. She also discussed how Palestinians are not allowed to talk about this reality and how this attempt to completely destroy the Palestinian people is accompanied uh, by an attempt to completely silence anybody who describes that attempt or um, to destroy the Palestinian people or talks about their rights. This is through the uh, IHRA definition and other uh, definitions that are being proposed at the moment. Um, Against this uh, campaign, Dr. Ziyade proposed that the experience of the Nakba must be uh, kept up front, uh, and uh, there should be a very tough stance taken on this, even in relation to uh, so-called allies, uh, or people who pretend to be allies, and preach to the Palestinians that they must stop talking about their rights. Uh, one of the most important points that was raised by Dr. Ziad in relation to uh, this regime of uh, silencing and a regime of strangulation and regime of economic and political control that she described um, is uh, the current Arab reality, which is very much connected to all of these processes. She emphasized, and I think uh, very aptly, the fact that we need to rethink the right of return in relation to contemporary realities of Arab normalization. Um, she beautifully stated that authoritarianism at the moment is working through Palestine. And that means uh, that we have a responsibility to uh, reimagine our orientation and surroundings and challenge uh, uh, the attempts to narrow down the Palestinian struggle uh, and to reduce it to the borders of Palestine alone. We have interconnections with liberation struggles across the Arab world. Um, finally, Akram Salhab 
drawing on his years of organizing experience, focused on the status of the refugees as a political status. And I think this was an incredibly important point uh, because we are often confronted with this discourse that views refugees simply um, as uh, poor people. This is the idea. Uh, if you're a victim, uh, if you're downtrodden, if you're wretched, if you're poor, you're in need of char a charity, this philanthropic model, uh, this model that completely depoliticizes uh, the Palestinian refugees. And by the way, um, some scholars now um, are beginning to contrast how, how that uh, model of depoliticizing the Palestinian refugees was simultaneously accompanied by an image of uh, um, Jewish refugees from Europe as empowered political, um, you know, always work, going on the street, always demanding their rights and so on and so forth. So it was an assertive vision. Um, that has very profound implications. Um, the, the fact that a refugee is not treated as a, as a, uh, as a political being um, also has to do with a, uh, with a profound uh, misunderstanding of what the Palestinian cause is about. And this is the sort of misunderstanding that allows for discourses that were uh, mentioned by uh, Salhab and others across this conference. Um, some researchers uh, come and tell us Palestinians Oh, you're a diaspora Palestinian, so therefore you can't be a refugee. Um, no, little, uh, we don't even recognize the word diaspora, by the way. It's shatat, not diaspora, but in any case, putting that on the side, that vision fails to understand that refugee status is a political status. It is not an economic status. Okay. Salahab focused also, drawing on, on this basis and building on it, that once we understand uh, this as in through a political lens, we will understand that also uh, the refugees have been completely disenfranchised from the political process as a whole. Uh, they are excluded from any representative structure at the moment, and they do not have any say in selecting their uh, official uh, uh, representatives that speak on their behalf. Therefore, there was a need to equalize the status of all Palestinians and to reject privileging one part of the Palestinian people over others. Akram Salab also focused on the current uh, challenges uh, confronting contemporary solidarity. He showed uh, how prevailing frameworks exclude Palestinians from their own national story as well uh, as their current struggle and future liberation. He showed how Palestinians are even excluded from stories uh, that are all about them uh, but that are, that are talked about as if they had nothing to do with. Uh, a good example being uh, the uh, recent anti-Semitism uh, uh, scandal and discussion in the UK. This was all about Palestine, but police, the Palestinians were completely removed from the discussion. On the IHRA, I, I believe we made a brilliant point when he tied attempts to silence Palestinians through that law and other instruments to the laws existing in such places as uh, Turkey and other countries that prevent discussion of war crimes. Um, he showed that uh, if we're gonna talk about the Palestinian cause in, in factual ways, uh, these laws would effectively criminalize us. They're not about confronting hatred, they're actually about inflicting hatred upon the Palestinians by burying their story. Um, how this happens in a place like the UK and other parts of Europe and even in the United States now, there's a big campaign. It, it happens because there's a lack of con confronting colonial history as, as uh, Akram notes. And especially when dealing with a live colonial situation like that of Palestine. In countries that haven't grappled with their own colonial history, how are we gonna expect them to grapple with the colonial present that they have created? Making visible Palestinian history and making visible the Palestinian present inside and outside Palestine is the only way forward. And uh, Akram Salhab uh, ended the conference on a very strong note here. 
you noted that this can only take place if we work really hard on reversing the crisis of representation and the exclusion of Palestinian refugees uh, from the PLO, uh, which is at the heart of that crisis. Um, because so long as Palestinians are not represented, so long as they do not have functioning national uh, organizations, then it is very difficult to organize nationally uh, on their uh, uh, behalf for them to carry out their own struggle becomes very difficult. And that leads to the individualization uh, of their platforms and to the proliferation of uh, different uh, claims uh, to Palestinian authority and authenticity and so on and so forth that do not serve the cause of uh, collective liberation um, and instead uh, facilitate the continuation of the colonial co uh, continuum that we have uh, talked about so extensively uh, today. I'm gonna end after this description with very quick notes for future research for potential topics that we have not talked about today and that I hope we will talk about in future sessions. Um, Professor Makhdisi raised an important question in the, in the Q&A box and it, it never got uh, a full discussion. And I'd like to re reiterate it now, which is where does the Arab history uh, side of the story fit in with this? After all, Palestinian refugees were all expelled into surrounding Arab states. And before the establishment of the PLO, uh, their cause was pretty much in the hands of these states, politically, in terms of representation. How uh, were the dynamics of return uh, experienced there? And I think this is a big topic. As a, as a historian, I experience this every day when I read about our history and when I look into our archives and witness especially the organizing in the 1950s that our refugees carried out. A lot of that organizing was uh, done to ensure that the Arab states uh, remained true to the uh, rights of the refugees. And, and there was this deep suspicion of state authorities, but deep confidence in the Arab peoples and throughout, throughout these movements. So a good example is in the case of Egypt in 1955. Uh, in March 1955, the first of March 1955, there was a, an intifada in, in Gaza. And that was all about the right of return, by the way. It was, the Egyptian government was under enormous pressure by the Americans to uh, resettle the refugees, and to do, uh, they were pursuing the so-called Sinai project, which is now some people are trying to rejuvenate it, believe it or not. Refugees uh, were therefore subjected to constant attacks by uh, uh, the Israeli government in the hope that this will encourage the Egyptian authorities to resettle them. So, you know, they were putting pressure on Egypt by launching airstrikes on Gaza and uh, launching strikes on Gaza and military operations on it. Um, by the way, Gaza has been assaulted since the Gaza Strip emerged. It's unbelievable the amount of assault that part of the world has been subjected to. But in any case, um, as soon as, uh, as an assault happened in, on the 28th of uh, uh, February, 1955, in Bir al-Safa, refugees the following day, starting from the schools, to go back to uh, Dr. Qatul's point about education, went out on massive demonstrations. It was the students that started chanting, لا توطين ولا إسكان يا عملاء الأمريكان. No uh, resettlement, no housing, uh, oh, agents of the Americans. So they were clear on who was trying to deny them their rights. They were clear on the fact that there was enormous pressure uh, exerted by imperial authorities upon, uh, on Arab states. All sorts of gifts were being offered and all sorts of uh, incredible violence was being inflicted on these states so that they could sell out their refugees. And now, as we're surrounded by this wave of normalization and wave of selling out the Palestinian people as a whole, it's important for us to study the history uh, of this pressure 
Uh, a second topic, I think, is the enormous energy uh, since the 1950s that was put on the part of the international, uh, so-called international community, which is really the United States, the uh, uh, Soviet Union, and the rest of, uh, and the old great uh, European powers, who were trying to liquidate uh, the right of return uh, through uh, supporting the establishment uh, of the colonial structure itself. So I think we need to discuss that. Uh, we need to highlight how the violence against the uh, Palestinian people that is currently inflicted through, uh, through military might, essentially, uh, and through economic might uh, is facilitated. And I hope that uh, this will be something that we will talk about in the future. Uh, enormous energy that is put into also um, the, uh, the complete dehistoricization of what took place, uh, the co complete attempt to present uh, histories that are actually quite bigoted and racist as factual histories as well. And a good example is Benny Morris, a good example is Yehoshua Porath, a good example is dozens of historians that people refer to as legitimate authorities whose histories are loaded. They go consult archives, but they use uh, paradigms that deny our people, that completely distort what took place, uh, and that would be counted in any other setting as, as, as denialism of the worst and filthiest type. Honestly, they, they would be criminalized in other settings. Uh, however, the discussion over the Nakba today, if you look at it, it's just a conversation amongst some Israeli historians with some references to Palestinian experiences here and there. We need to liberate that story. We need to liberate the, the following stories, the story of the Palestinian revolution as well from these discourses. Uh, and we need to discuss that in future conferences. And I hope uh, that we will be able to repeat this wonderful uh, session that we had today uh, that um, took place despite an enormous campaign to try to prevent talking about Palestine as a whole, let alone the Palestinian refugee that lies at its heart in uh, institutions across the West. So thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate your presence.